up to people on the street and ask them if they believe they were going to heaven assuming people believe in the afterlife most people would say yes but if you turn to ask them what makes them so sure of this you're going to get a variety of answers some people believe that everybody is going to heaven save maybe the worst of the worst people like murderers and rapists and child molesters other be others believe they're going to heaven because they are good people. They feed the poor, they give to charity, and do other good works. And still others believe they're going to heaven because they are religious. They go to worship services every week, they give their money to the church, and do other things that their religious book tells them to do. The question is, why do we get so many different answers? One of the main reasons is because the people believe that there are multiple ways to heaven. If you believe in Muhammad, that's okay. If you believe in some of the Hindu gods, that's okay. And if you believe in Jesus, well, that's okay too. Of course, upon further examination of all of these religious texts, you would know that such a belief cannot be true. The Quran doesn't say that one can get to what they would call heaven without being a Muslim. The Hindus don't believe that you can ultimately become one with the Brahman, their creator God, without being a Hindu. And of course, the Bible teaches that one can't get to heaven without faith in Jesus. In Acts chapter 4, verses 8 to 12, we read, Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers of the people and elders of Israel, if we are judged this day for a good deed done to a helpless man, by what means he has been made well, let it be known to you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man stands before you whole. This is the stone which was rejected by you builders which has become the chief cornerstone. Nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name given among, under heaven, given among men, by which we must be saved. Therefore, despite what people may think, you can't be a Hindu and believe that practicing Christians and Muslims are going to be saved in this life. You can't be a Muslim and believe that practicing Christians and Hindus are going to be saved in this life. And you can't be a Christian and believe that practicing Muslims and Hindus are going to be saved in this life. But I suggest that you also can't be a Christian and believe that the people in every denomination that claims to follow Christ are going to be saved in this life, no matter what they think. Why do I believe that? Turn, if you would, to Matthew chapter 7. We're going to start reading at verse 13. Matthew 7, beginning at verse 13. Enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And there are many who go in by it. Because narrow is the gate, and difficult is the way which leads to life, and there are few who find it. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Even so, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. And a good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Therefore, by their fruits, you will know them. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? And I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, 
you who practice lawlessness. In the Sermon on the Mount here, Jesus tells his listeners to enter in at the narrow gate, the narrow entrance. For wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction, and many will find it. But narrow is the gate and difficult is the way that leads to life, and few will find it. Knowing this then, what we're going to be doing today is to answer two questions. One, what is the narrow gate? And two, how do I use the narrow gate to enter into life? Let's start with the first question. What is the narrow gate that Jesus speaks of? And of course, the answer to that question is Jesus himself and his teachings. In John chapter 10, we're going to be spending a lot of time in this section in, in the book of John, and especially in chapter 10, but you can go to John chapter 10. We're going to read verses 7 to 10. John chapter 10, verses 7 to 10. Then Jesus said to them, Most assuredly I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief does not come in to except to steal and to kill and to destroy. I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. In the book of John, there are several I am statements by Jesus that are meant to show his deity. Just as God told Moses that his name was I am in Exodus 3 verse 14. Examples of some of these I am statements in John are I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the bread of life. I am the resurrection and the life. And here in John 10, I am the door of the sheep. A door, of course, provides the way of entrance. Without a door, all you would have is walls and a roof and no way to get past them. However, with a door, you can pass into the structure and enjoy what is inside the walls. That is what Jesus is to the sheep. He is the door. To life. In other words, you have to pass through this door to enter life. But as we know, in most structures, there are many doors that provide entrances. Most houses have a front door and a back door. Some have garage doors. In office buildings, there are multiple doors in which you can enter. This type of thinking has led some people to believe that there are multiple doors into heaven and Jesus simply is a door. But that's not what Jesus meant here. He is saying, I am the door. Now we could focus on the difference between using the word a versus the word the and make the point if I, it, of saying that if I say I am a door, that implies more than one. Well, if I say I am the door, that implies only one. But that's not the word I'd like us to focus on here. Because again, this is an I am statement. A statement about Jesus' deity. If we can show that Jesus is deity, then that necessarily proves that, there, that he is the only door. To understand why... Let's go back to Exodus 3 and see how this phrase, I am, is used there. In Exodus chapter 3, let's start reading at verse 1. Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock back, uh, sorry, and he led the flock to the back of the desert and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire from the midst of the bush. So he looked, and behold, the bush was burning with fire, but the bush was not consumed. Then Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight, why the bush does not burn. So when the Lord saw that, he turned aside to look. God called to him from the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, Here I am. 
Then he said, Do not draw near this place. Take your sandals off your feet, for the place where you stand is holy ground. Moreover, he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. And the Lord said, I have surely seen the oppression of my people who are in Egypt, and have heard their cry because of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. So I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians, and to bring them up from, the land, from that land to do a good and large land, to a land flowing with milk and honey, to a place of the Canaanites, the Hittites, and the Amorites, and the Perizzites, and the Hivites, and the Jebusites. Now therefore, behold, the cry of the children of Israel has come to me, and I have also seen the oppression with, with, the, with which the Egyptians oppress them. Come now, therefore, and I will send you to Pharaoh, that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh, and that I should bring the children of Israel out of Egypt? So he said, I will certainly be with you, and this will be the sign to you that I have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will serve God on this mountain. Then Moses said to God, Indeed, when I come to the children of Israel and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they say to me, What is his name? What shall I say to them? And God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, Thus you shall say to the children of Israel, I am has sent me to you. Moreover, God said to Moses, Thus you shall say to the children of Israel, The Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and this is my memorial to all generations. This is an amazing story that we often tell to children when they're little, but it contains some profound thoughts that adults can learn too. Here we have Moses around the age of 80, tending to sheep in Midian because he had to flee Egypt 40 years earlier after killing an Egyptian. He sees a bush that is burning, that is not being consumed, approaches it, and a voice comes from the bush which says to remove his sandals and did not come near, for the ground which he was standing was holy ground. The voice identified him as himself as the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Now at that time, just like today, people believed in many gods. Every nation had their own gods and their own faith. But the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob was different than those other so-called gods. When Moses... I got ahead of myself. When Moses was told to go and lead Israel out of Egypt, Moses asked what God's name was. For if Moses didn't know that, then Israel might not believe him. God said, I am who I am. Now our English translations really don't do that justice. Because I can say I am who I am and simply mean that I am Jeremy and not somebody else. No, that's not what God is saying here when he says, I am who I am. When he says that, he is saying that he is the unchanging and eternal being or God of this universe. God isn't saying that he is a God among many. He is saying that he is the only God and that there is nobody else beside him. And what's more is that this name is his name forever. And this will be a memorial to all generations. Therefore, even though he identifies himself as the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, he isn't exclusive to these men alone. He is the God over all people, even if those people don't worship and serve him. If God is the only God of this universe, then he should show the attributes of God and all of the attributes of God, not just some of the attributes of the people, of the gods that people claim to worship. For God to be the only God of this universe, he needs to be all-powerful. He needs to be able to do anything. The Bible teaches that God is the creator of this universe, speaking it, it into existence by the word of his power. Evidence exists today for this to be true. 
The Bible teaches that God provided Israel manna from heaven. And eyewitnesses wrote that down so that future generations would know that. The Bible teaches that God was able to perform other miracles, such as heal diseases like he did with Hezekiah in 2 Kings 20. And the Bible teaches that God has the power over death, which means that he can raise the dead, just as 1 Corinthians 15 says. But along with his all-powerfulness, the God of the Bible is described as all-knowing. You can only... You can be the only, you cannot be, sorry, the only God and not know everything. If you were partly knowing, you either were not a God or not the only God. Because there would be other gods who would know something that you didn't. God knows all about how this universe works. Scientists don't know this. Philosophers don't know this. You and I don't know this. God knows the hearts and minds of everyone. He knows what we will do before we do it because he knows us that well. That is how he is able to righteously judge us. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 9 to 11, we read, Therefore we make it our aim, whether present or absent, to be well-pleasing to him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body, according to what he has done, whether good or bad. Knowing, therefore, the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. But we are well known to God, and I also trust are well known in your consciences. The only way that God can judge us according to what we have done in the body is if he knows everything we have done in the body. God knows all. And that's because God is everywhere. God is spirit, according to John 4, 24. He is not confined to time and space. He is in heaven. You cannot say that of the Greek gods. Poseidon was the god of the sea and confined to the things of the sea in Greek mythology. Aphrodite was the goddess of love, beauty, passion, and procreation and confined to the things associated with that. These were false gods. However, the true God of heaven is present everywhere and not confined by anything. And along with all these things, the only God of this universe is all righteous. He does not sin. He does not make mistakes. The idols of this world can be wrong. They can act with sinful desires. They are like us. Not so with the true God. He is above us, and he does not sin. For James 1.13 says, Let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. The God of the Bible is all of these things. And since he is all of these things, all other gods are necessarily false. Allah cannot be, descri cannot, cannot be ascribed to these things. For he was devised by Muhammad in around the middle of the first millennia after Christ. The Hindu gods, though they go further back than Allah, only date to the second to third millennium before Christ. The God of the Bible goes back to the beginning. He is the I Am. Now, does the Bible teach that Jesus is the I Am? And that he ever claimed such. Let's go back to the book of John. We read this earlier this morning in our Bible class, but we're going to read it again. In John chapter 1, verses 1 to 5, we're going to start there, and then we'll skip down to read verses 14 to 18. John chapter 1, beginning at verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him, nothing was made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. Now skip down to verse 14. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. The glory is the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. John bore witness of him and cried out, saying, This was he of whom I said, he who comes after me is preferred before me. 
for he was before me. And of his fullness we have all received, and grace for grace. For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son who is in the bosom of the Father, he has declared him. John makes it pretty clear, in the beginning was the Word. The Word is identified as becoming flesh, the man Jesus. The Word was not only in the beginning with God, the Word was God. No, Jesus is not the Father, for that is what verse 18 says when, it's, when it says, that's what verse 18 means when it says that nobody has seen God at any time. It means no one has seen the form of the Heavenly Father, but it is Jesus, God the Son, who has declared the Father to us. Make no mistake, though, John 1 claims that Jesus is God. Well, someone might say, well, that's John, the writer of the book. He is declaring Jesus to be God, but Jesus never claimed such. Yes, he did. Let's skip ahead to John chapter 8. We're going to start reading there at verse 37. John chapter 8, beginning at verse 37. I know that you are Abraham's descendants, but you seek to kill me because my word has no place in you. I speak what I have seen with my father, and you do what you have seen with your father. They answered and said to him, Abraham is our father. Jesus said to them, if you were Abraham's children, you would do the works of Abraham. But now you seek to kill me, a man who has told you the truth which I heard from God. Abraham did not do this. You do the deeds of your father. Then they said to him, We were not born of fornication. We have one Father, God. Jesus said to them, If God were your Father, you would love me, for I proceeded forth and came from God. Nor have I come of myself, but he sent me. Why do you not understand my speech? Because you are not able to listen to my word. You are of your father, the devil, and the desires of your father you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources, for he is a liar and the father of it. But because I tell the truth, you do not believe me. Which of you convicts me of sin? And if I tell the truth, why do you not believe me? He who is of God hears God's words. Therefore, you do not hear because you are not of God. Then the Jews answered and said to him, Do we not say rightly that you are a Samaritan and have a demon? Jesus answered, I do not have a demon, but I honor my father and you dishonor me. And I do not seek my own glory. There is one who seeks and judges. Most assuredly, I say to you, if anyone keeps my word, he shall never see death. Then the Jews said to him, now we know that you have a demon. Abraham is dead and the prophets and the prophets. And you say, if anyone keeps my word, he shall never taste death. Are you greater than our father Abraham, who is dead? And the prophets are de- who are dead? Who do you make yourself out to be? Jesus answered, If I honor myself, my honor is nothing. It is my Father who honors me, of whom you say that he is your God. Yet you have not known him, but I know him. And if I say I, did, I do not know him, I shall be a liar like you. But I do know him and keep his word. Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. Then the Jews said to him, You are not yet 50 years old, and you have seen Abraham? Jesus said to them, Most assuredly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. Then they took up stones to throw at him. But Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple, going through the midst of them, and so passed by. For all those people who like to say that Jesus never claimed to be God in the Bible, I like to take them right here to John 8. Jesus was chastising the Jews for wanting to kill him while claiming to be the sons of Abraham and the sons of God. For had they been so, they would know that Jesus was teaching the word of God. Jesus said that they who keep his words would never see death, meaning spiritual death, just like Abraham did. The Jews scoffed at Jesus' sayings and said, You're not 50 years old and let you're claiming to, be, to have seen Abraham? Jesus' response was, before Abraham was, I am. 
Here is where Jesus claimed unequivocally to be God, the unchanging and eternal God. The name by which Moses was to tell the Hebrews that he was sent. And you don't have to wonder if the Jews understood what Jesus meant, but they picked up stones to stone him for blasphemy. But what if John isn't telling the truth? In John 21, verses 24 and 25, the book closes this way. This is the disciple who testifies of these things and wrote these things, and we know that his testimony is true. And there are many other things that Jesus did, which are if they were written one by one, I suppose that even the world itself could not contain the books that would be written. Amen. John's words could be tested. His testimony could be proven. And his testimony was that Jesus was God. There were many people who heard those words spoken. And the empty tomb and the resurrection confirmed that Jesus was speaking the truth. So going back to John 10, when Jesus said, I am the door of the sheep, he wasn't claiming to be a door. He was claiming to be the only door because he was the only God. That's why the gate or the door is narrow. The devil has convinced mankind that any religion will do, that any quote-unquote Christian denomination will do. Jesus said it is not so, for he was the only way to life. And it would be difficult to enter by this gate because in order to do so, we will have to give up our pride and submit only to Jesus. James says in James 4, verses 7 to 10, Therefore submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Lament and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he will lift you up. That last part is so hard. For we have been taught that the way of physical success is through our own strength. That is just not true of spiritual success. Yes, we have to have a faith that obeys, but it is God's grace that is received through obedient faith that cleanses us of our sins and grants us life. We cannot save ourselves by ourselves we need to humble ourselves in the sight of the lord and he will lift us up for he is the only door into heaven which segues nicely into our second question which is how do i use the narrow gate to get into life well the answer of course to that question is to believe in and obey jesus there are some who say that all you need to do is believe in Jesus. What does the Bible say? We read earlier in Matthew 7, 21, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. You see, the narrow gate isn't only narrow for those who follow other religions, and it won't be a way for them to get in if they follow those other religions. It's narrow for those who want to follow Jesus too. We first of all have to recognize that there is only one true church. There is only one true Holy Spirit. There is only one true baptism. There is only one true faith. In Ephesians chapter 4, in verses 1 to 7, hear what Paul writes. I, therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called, with all lowliness and gentleness, with long suffering, bearing with one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. We can't be united in Christ if we don't follow all of what he says. We can't be united in Christ if we don't teach what Christ teaches about the church. That only the people who are part of the church that follows him will be saved. 
We can't be united with Christ if we don't believe in the one Holy Spirit that Christ revealed to us and recognize what the Holy Spirit does for Christians today. We can't be united in Christ if we don't have the faith in the one hope that Christ told us about, a hope of eternal salvation in heaven. We can't be united with Christ while denying the very deity of the one we claim to follow, the very deity that Christ claimed for himself. We can't believe, we can't be united in Christ if we don't believe in the one faith that is taught by Christ, which was once delivered by the apostles and inspired prophets in the first century and preserved for us in what we call the New Testament. We can't be united in Christ if we don't believe in the one baptism, water baptism for the remission of sins that was commanded by Christ in order to receive salvation. And we can't be united in Christ if we don't believe in the one God and Father who is above all things and brought about not only this universe, but salvation in Christ. Unity in Christ is not just about believing in Jesus. It's about believing in and doing what he says. It's not a salvation by faith alone, but by a faith that works. In James chapter 2, beginning at verse 14, we read, What does it profit, my brethren, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can faith save him? If a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you says to them, Depart in peace, be warmed and filled, but do not give them the things which are needed for the body, what does it profit? Thus also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that there is one God, you do well. Even the demons believe and tremble. But do you want to know, a foolish man, that faith without works is dead? Was not our our Abraham our father justified by works when he offered Isaac his son on the altar? Do you see that faith was working together with his works, and by works faith was made perfect? And the scripture was fulfilled which says Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. You see then that a man is justified by works and not by faith only. Likewise, was not Rahab the harlot also justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out another way? For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. This section of James is a good section to read for those who want to know if belief alone will do them any good. People of James's day claim to be followers of Jesus, claim to be Christians, and yet we're showing partiality. And we're not loving their neighbor as themselves. They claim to have a faith in Jesus, but their faith was dead because they didn't obey all the commands of Jesus. Well, faith extends far beyond what Jesus commanded concerning our relationship with our neighbor. For it includes the things that Jesus commands concerning our relationship with God too. 1 John 2 verses 3 to 6 says, Now by this we know that we know him if we keep his commandments. He who says I know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, truly the love of God is perfected in him. By this we know that we are in him. He who says he abides in him ought himself also to walk just as he walked. In order to enter life through the narrow gate, we must keep all of God's commandments. We must obey God's command to believe in Jesus, repent of our sins, confess our faith, and be baptized for the remission of our sins. We must obey God's commands concerning how to live a godly life how to worship him properly, and what church we should belong to. And we must obey God's commands to love our neighbor as ourselves. What happens when we fall short of God's commands? Well, if we're not a Christian, we first need to become one. But if we are a Christian, let's back up in 1 John to chapter 1 and begin reading at verse 5. This is the message which we have heard from him and declare to you, that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, 
we have fellowship with one another in the blood of Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. The truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. My little children, these things I write to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he himself is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the whole world. We cannot walk in darkness and have fellowship with God. But fortunately for us, God sent Jesus to die on the cross for our sins. And if we're Christians, we're children of God, and have the right for Jesus to act as our mediator. We can in repentance pray to God for the forgiveness of our sins. And God has not only promised to hear our prayer. But to forgive us our sins through Christ. If we will walk by faith by doing what God says. And depend on his grace when we fall short. If we will leave the broad path that leads to hell. And walk on the narrow path that leads to heaven we will enter through the narrow gate that was made possible by Jesus Christ himself. Jesus said in John 14, verses 1 to 6, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. And where I go and the way or, and where I go you know and the way you know Thomas said to him Lord we do not know where you are going and how can we know the way Jesus said I am the way the truth and the life and no man comes to the father except through me To the Christian these can be comforting words Jesus died and went to heaven in order to prepare a place for us but he has promised to return one day and receive us unto himself, that where he is, we may be also. But to the non-Christian, these words can be terrifying. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through him. There is no other way to heaven except through Jesus. Meaning that we have to give up all of ourselves, our pride, our opinions, and our fleshly desires and rely solely on Jesus to provide us the way through the narrow gate. The question I have for you now is, are you on the narrow road? If not, why not take the off-ramp from the broad road that is provided by Jesus by becoming a Christian today? If you're watching at home, you can obey Jesus without even being present in person. If you're watching with others, confess your faith to them, and they can take you to a place of baptism. If you're watching alone, though, go to eastendchurch.org, find our contact information there, and we will assist you in any way we can. I'm not ashamed to own my Lord.